Hello, my friends. We're back with another installment of our story, Wish Tree by Catherine Applegate. We're just about to hear right now, Red has broken the rule, the don't talk to people rule, Red, the tree. And we're going to hear what he has to say to Stephen and Samar. Okay. Chapter 31. I haven't always been a wish tree. It happened in 1848, long before I was surrounded by concrete and cars, when I was just a few decades old, still a youngster by red oak standards, no longer a lanky sapling. I was solid and strong, but not anchored to the earth the way I am now. This was a time, like many other times, when hungry, desperate people sailed on crowded boats to settle here. Many of them ended up, as they always seemed to, in my neighborhood. The blue and green houses were brown then, and filled to overflowing with new arrivals. Sometimes the newcomers were welcomed, sometimes they were not, but they still came, hoping and wishing, as people always do. One of our new residents was a young Irish girl named Maeve. She'd voyaged across the Atlantic with her 19-year-old brother, who had died of dysentery during the trip. Their mother had passed away shortly after Maeve was born, their father when the children were 9 and 12. Maeve was solid and plain, but when she smiled it was like sunshine peeking through the clouds. She had a deep laugh and her hair was as brilliantly red as my finest autumn attire. Sixteen, alone, and penniless. Maeve shared a tiny room with five other immigrants. She worked night and day, cleaning and cooking and doing whatever she could to stay alive. Maeve soon discovered that she was gifted at caring for the sick. She had no special knowledge, no secret remedies, but she was kind and patient and she knew how to soothe the fevered brow with a cool cloth as well as anyone. What she didn't know, she was willing to learn. As time passed, word grew of Maeve's abilities. People brought her their sick piglets and their lame horses, their coughing children and fretful babies. Always she explained that she wasn't sure she could help. But since people in the neighborhood were too poor to go to a doctor, they turned to Maeve. And since people believed that she could help them get better, Maeve tried to live up to their hopes. When she succeeded, and even when she didn't, patients and their families would leave small tokens for her. A whittled figurine of a bird, a hairpin, half a loaf of bread, once, someone even left a leather-covered journal with a tiny silver key that opened its lock. When Maeve was out tending to someone who was sick, people took to leaving their thank yous in my lowest hollow. It was still a fresh wound, just a couple of seasons mended, but because it faced the house where Maeve roomed and not the street, it was a safe place to leave a token of gratitude. That's when I realized that hollows can be a good thing for people, not just birds and animals. Little did I know just how good. Chapter 32 The years passed and Maeve became as connected to the neighborhood as I was. Even as newcomers from other lands added their music and food and language to our little part of the world, no matter where people were from, Maeve cared for them as best she could. I grew tougher, my older limbs less pliable, my shadow longer. More trees and shrubs joined me. But there was plenty of sun for us all, and we never wanted for water. I'd hosted many families by then, mice and chipmunks in particular. My closest confidant was a young gray squirrel named Squibbles. All squirrel names begin with the letters S-Q-U. Squibbles was especially fond of Maeve, who often fed the little squirrel table scraps. 
Privately, Squibbles and I worried about Maeve. Along the way, Maeve had seen a suitor or two, but nothing much came of those flirtations. She had friends aplenty and work to do from dawn till dusk. Still, she seemed lonely. Sometimes Maeve would sit on the porch steps, watching happy families stroll past, and her eyes would well up with tears. At night, she'd gaze out an open upstairs window, and her sighs would float to us on the breeze, melancholy as the call of a morning dove. Often, Maeve would sit at the base of my trunk and write in her journal. Now and then, she'd read passages aloud. She spoke about the Irish countryside fading into a fog. She spoke about her family she'd lost. She spoke about her secret hopes and fears and longings. She had love to give and no one to give it to. Maeve adored early mornings, when the world was bathed in mist and the sun was still a promise. She would lean against my trunk and close her eyes and hum a tune from her childhood. One day, the first day of May, Maeve joined me at dawn. To my surprise, she reached up to my lowest bow and gently tied a scrap of blue striped fabric in a careful knot. I wish, she whispered, for someone to love with all my heart. That was my first wish and the beginning of many more. Chapter 33 As the weeks passed, this piece of fabric on my branch drew many comments. Some of the folks in our neighborhood, the ones from Ireland, would nod knowingly and smile. To them, Maeve would simply say in her lilting voice, That's my raggy tree. She's not a hawthorn, but she'll do just fine. People who'd come here from other lands and there were many of them, would frown at the rag or even reach up to remove it. Maeve would warn, don't you be touching my wish now. Patiently again and again, she would explain how in her old home, leaving wishes on a raggy tree was a time-honored tradition. Then and now, people would ask Maeve what she'd wish for. She'd tell them the truth with a sigh and a wry smile. Nothing much, just someone to love with all my heart. Nothing much, just someone to love, nothing much at all. Sometimes people would laugh. Sometimes they would roll their eyes. A wish on a rag won't bring you love, dearie, they would say. But usually, people gave Maeve a kind smile, a squeeze on the arm, a knowing nod. And then they too would ask, if they could add a wish of their own. Chapter 34 Another year passed. As May neared, I found myself hosting more scraps of fabric than budding leaves. Squibbles tried to steal a few fabric straps to line his dray, the nest made of leaves and twigs high in one of my forked branches. I explained he'd have to stick with moss and pine needles until after the first of May. Wishes, according to Maeve, could not be touched until after May Day. Then the ones that weren't carried off in the wind or dragged to the ground by the rain could be removed by people or by enterprising squirrels. I suspect she made up that rule for my benefit so I could grow unfettered without the weight of wet rags dragging me down. Just before dawn on the 1st of May, a young woman approached me. She had dark wavy hair and wore a tattered gray coat. In her arms was wrapped a bundle. Psst, Squibbles whispered to me, here comes another wish, Red. But Squibbles was wrong. There was no wish. Swiftly, but with great care, the girl placed her bundle in my hollow. A thank you for Maeve, I realized. A loaf of bread, perhaps. The girl had probably been one of her patients. She was gone as quickly as she'd come. Like a hummingbird, I thought, there, then not there. 
like a gust of wind. And that's where we're going to end it for today. I wonder what that bundle was in the hollow. We'll find out tomorrow as Red continues his story and violates the rule of not talking to people. But right now, let's talk to God. Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you for wishes and for surprises and for thank yous and signs of gratitude. Help us to continue to wish and to say thank you. Amen. Now, it's really time. Time. Time for bed. So I hope you've brushed your teeth, got your jams on, washed your face and hands. Then hop into bed. Good night.